Um, my name is Tracy Sterling, and I'm the Department Head for Land Resources and Environmental Sciences. I've been here a little over a year, and what I'd like to do today is first introduce myself and then have you introduce yourself so we know where we are and what sort of faculty position you guys are thinking about, and I can pepper my talk with some of those considerations as we go through. <coughs> I am from the Midwest. I got my bachelor's at University of Minnesota, so I'm a gopher. And then I went to Michigan State, um, the other MSU, and got my master's, and I'm also a Spartan. And then lastly, I came back to be another rodent, a badger, um, at the University of Wisconsin. And then was very fortunate to get a faculty position right out of graduate school, and that's less and less common. Most PhDs, particularly in the natural sciences, need to do postdoctoral work. Uh, which is a very glorious time as well as grad being in graduate school. And so then I was a professor of weed physiology. My background is plant physiology. I focused on weed science, invasive uh, management, or in management of invasive weeds, uh, biological control of those plants, and then stress toler tolerance, biochemistry of stress tolerance. Um, and I wanted to show you where New Mexico was. There's a little green ch or a little red chili pepper there. I really had to look on a map because I was from the Midwest and that's all I knew. Um, and so I uh, had to find out where I was going, which was in Las Cruces, New Mexico. It's also a land grant institution, just like Montana State University. Similar size, a little bit bigger. Um, and then this job opened up uh, after my 20 years as a, research, in a, as a research and teaching faculty member. Um, this opportunity was too great to bypass, so I became a bobcat. Um, and you notice my colors now are yellow and blue, or gold and blue, right? Where I'm now a department head for land resources and environmental sciences, which has about 25 to 30 faculty members, um, depending on how you count, uh, across many, many disciplines related to land resources and environmental sciences. I hope you'll find them useful. What I'd like to do, um, is since we've done our introductions, is to framework, or use this framework for the talk. First talk about search committees, that's where it all starts. And next, secondly, then talk about how one should prepare for an interview, and then how one should do an interview, and then uh, what, what you should do after the interview. Which I just re realized I didn't put a slide for that, but I'll, I'll tell you my tips on that when we get there. Um, what I'd also like to do is, Please ask that you interrupt me if you have questions or some insights that I've, I've forgotten to share or that you've heard from your mentors or advisors or committee members. Okay. Um, one of the things I did want to point out is um, specifically to faculty positions and de depending on where you go, or I guess not depending on where you go, being a faculty member is what a glorious job. It's a really, it's probably the best job you could have. Uh, faculty members are known to have the most job satisfaction of, most, of almost any other work group. Um, and a lot of that, I think, is because of the autonomy and the independence you have. Although you're within an institution and a structure where you do need to serve and be part of that community and help with the functioning of the department, uh, just that um, ability to make or break your own track is, is just really a, an exciting uh, venture. Um, and I, I just, I had the best time at New Mexico State for 20 years and really was enjoying my job. But the only reason I left is because this job had additional challenges that I was looking for, okay? I could have easily stayed where I was uh, as a full professor, smoking my pipe, which is not what you do as a full professor. I just wanted to tell you that. Um, okay. So in terms of where it starts, search committees, always be cognizant that um, Searches are really starting well before someone has identified a position in a department. Uh, you are meeting individuals at various institutions when you're at conferences, and that's a really great way to start networking and getting a sense of what sort of institution you would like to work at. Um, and so networking can't be underemphasized. Uh, Usually search committee membership is comprised of those in the department who are of similar disciplinary background, but also additional individuals could be brought in uh, from either other departments, 
uh, or stakeholders could be brought in, such as students, those you will be teaching. And if you have a, a position that interacts a lot with the public, someone like a grower or an agency representative, or say someone from the film industry uh, would be part of that committee, depending on how, on how the institution uh, uh, forms their search committees. These search committees are trained on how to approach a search, and a lot of that is for equity issues. Has any of he you here served on, as a, on a search committee? Okay. okay, several of you. All right. And Tanya, I know you were on the search committee for the cluster hire in our department, where we had three brand new faculty come in at once. There were 200 applications. 300 plus. 300 plus, okay. Um, and, and so part of, uh, if you can imagine that sort of position, part of it is how do you get the attention of this search committee, okay? Um, what I also, okay, they're coached on the appropriate questions. Um, and many, many search committees are designed, so they have a list of questions that they ask equally of every candidate. Other search committees are much more loosely uh, uh, built and they, the conversation just happens. Um, and there's pluses and minuses to both. Uh, when there's canned, uh, I don't like the inter when I've been interviewed with canned questions because you don't feel it's a conversation. Um, uh, and so it, it's harder to uh, let them know who you are, in my opinion. But that's their choice. So just be prepared for that sort of thing. Um, the other thing I want to point out about search committee members is that they really are your advocate. They, they have chosen you to interview for this position. They want you to succeed. They want to have a brilliant new person in their department uh, to help them uh, move forward. So this is really what, uh, they're, they're really wanting to help you along. And in fact, when you're going through your conversations with the search committee, you know, you'll meet with them usually at the beginning of an interview uh, as a separate committee. And many times they'll coach you on a few things, like, you know, well, when you meet with so-and-so, um, remember uh, that their interest is in student success or things like that. So they might be able to help you along that way. So you're, you're helping highlight some of your uh, attributes um, for that individual you're, you're talking to in terms of their interest. And also I'd like you to recognize that the search committees and the institution are looking for the best fit. And I put that in quotes because there's a lot of definitions for best fit. If you think about, you've got the search committee uh, who have their ideas on who should fill that position and the criteria uh, are set in the position description, but um, uh, they, everybody brings a different agenda to the table. Uh, the dean has an idea, the department head, your colleagues would have an idea, the students. So the best fit is really an amalgamation of all these individuals. And the reason I bring that up, that there are many definitions, is that uh, if you are not, if you are chosen for the interview but not for, as the final candidate and offered the job, that's not a failure, okay, because there's so many factors that go in and you will find the right fit for you, okay. So you view it as a positive experience. Uh, just, has anyone ever had a paper rejected, a manuscript? No, not in this audience. <laughs> And I, you know, when I've had criticisms on papers, what I like to do is say, oh, you know, why didn't they get it? But I, I try and bring it back to myself and say, what didn't I say that I should have? But also, um, I view it as a positive experience to improve on myself and how I portray myself and my work. Okay. And I, I would recommend that in this interview process because you may go through a few, and they're 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 a lot of fun. It's a very heady experience to be interviewed because all the attention's on you. Um, but you're also accountable for all the things that you're saying and that you want to be able to portray yourself in the best light. <coughs> yeah. So here are some general uh, items uh, which um, I'm going to show you the references at the end of this, those uh, resources I used to, to uh, get some ideas for this talk. Um, but this individual had uh, several of these ideas uh, Dr. Reese, um, who publishes quite a bit in the Chronicle of Higher Education, which is a really good re resource. You all should probably 
uh, subscribe to that and read it periodically. Um, so here are some of the things that committee or search committees look for. How do you compare with others in your field? Uh, what are your capabilities as a scientist or educator, I should say? Do you show promise of continued development and professional growth? Uh, do you have the potential to direct the work of others? Do you have the potential to collaborate? And what is your interest and experience with teaching and working with students? And then a, a tough one sometimes is uh, what is your teaching philosophy? And I'll talk a little bit about that um, in a minute. But these are some of the things that the search committee will use to, when they review those 300 applicants, or depending on your field, there may only be 20 applicants. What is it that will set you aside from those other individuals? And it, making sure it's still true, right? Because <laughs> once you show up, it is, it's not true um, that you love teaching uh, and you give a really bad teaching seminar. Um, it'll be pretty clear um, that you're not the best fit for them. Um, how do you prepare for an interview? And I, I think it starts very early um, uh, by uh, how you prepare your career and what areas you work in, of course, and your advisor and your relationship with your committee, etc. cetera. Uh, but is this really the job that you want? Have you read the job ad? Do you perhaps see the title, um, but then do you read everything in the job ad? And job ads are written by the search committees in general with guidance by the dean in terms of the direction of the, the unit or the, the college or the university. Um, and it's very important that while you're preparing your materials, you're considering that job ad. So uh, blanket sending the same CV, the same cover letter to every, every open position you see will not probably, will probably will not get you an interview. You need to be clear that you want that job. And then you should be clear with yourself. Do you want to research one faculty job, or do you want a community college um, job? So it's, be thinking about those as well. Um, okay, and then I've mentioned before, how will you get the search committee's attention? Did you have a question back there? No, okay. So how will you get the search committee's quest, uh, attention based on the information I presented before? Um, I believe it's by <coughs> speaking to the job ad, okay? Recognizing, Here are my, here's my background, and a lot of these materials uh, that I've, I've referenced here. This one is from Science Careers at the, um, the site for Science Magazine, uh, which is a really good site. Even if you're a social scientist or a humanities uh, individual, there's just some good tips, regardless of your discipline. And I'll have those posted on the, the end of the slide as well, or at the end of the talk as well. Um, but at this, they, they talk, they spend a lot of time uh, or they don't spend a lot of time. There's a lot of resources on how to build a good CV, how to do a good cover letter, um, and I guess this is where you get the attention is in the cover letter, a very well-crafted cover letter. Not too long, not too short. Um, don't say, uh, inside are my materials for the job. You wanna have a compelling story of why you're really interested in this job and this institution and why you fit. How is your um, background? Um, and experiences going to help them with their goals. Many times um, there's a teaching statement that's asked for. I had a few things I wanted to say about that. More and more, about 50% of the job applications have a request for a teaching philosophy. And, um, and it's even higher in the natural scientists, sciences. And I'm wondering um, why that is. I'm not quite sure. but. I think the natural sciences perhaps have individuals get less teaching experience, less formal teaching experience in terms of uh, lecturing. Uh, they certainly help in labs. A lot of us have done TA work. Uh, but I think the social sciences and humanities, the individuals are, are have had more practice at the art of teaching. Um, and I'm wondering if that's why the natural scientists, science area has, is asking for more of these teaching philosophy statements. Um, nonetheless, they are asking for them, and how, how, um, how should you address that? Well, there's a nice uh, a piece in Tomorrow's Professor, uh, which you could just Google. It's a Stanford uh, site. Uh, it's a site at Stanford um, called Tomorrow's Professor. It mainly caters to the sciences, uh, natural sciences, but uh, again, it's got very good tips across disciplines. And um, 
what the teaching philosophy really does is it tells your approach to teaching and to learning. Okay? We're not just expounding and telling people things, but how are students actually learning? Um, what you should probably include in this are things that uh, explain what drew you to the discipline. And those are things you could also have in the cover letter that say why you really love what you're doing. Um, and uh, one thing to avoid in a teaching philosophy, I think, is saying, I love to teach, because there's really no context for that. Um, so explaining why is it that you love to teach. And what they're looking for is uh, evidence of practice, uh, reflection, that you've thought about it, that it's student-centered, um, that you're student-centered, and uh, the essence that it, it, the philosophy is really showing your value of teaching. And I say this uh, rather than spending a lot of time talking about research, because I think we all are targeting in on our research more and know that story pretty cold um, in terms of why we're here and why we're, why we're seeking a faculty position, is to continue that scholarship. Um, but also to share that is the teaching philosophy piece, which I think is should not be underestimated. Uh, because that could, if, if you had everything else was glorious and you didn't pay attention to the teaching philosophy in your application, uh, you may not get the interview. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and folks are not looking for, you know, a uniquely innovative pedagogy, but uh, more that you're committed to teaching, as, as committed to teaching as you are to your research. Um, let's see. Um, the other component is uh, letters of reference. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about a tailored CV. I think each of your, your disciplines has a unique uh, classical way of, of presenting yourself in a, in a curriculum to take. Does everyone know what CV means? <laughs> um, and there's some guidance at these websites in terms of how to, how to create a CV. But letters of reference are, are things that you really cultivate very early in your career uh, by the choice of your advisor um, and uh, your committee members, the collaborators you, ha collaborators you have on your research projects on the campus and elsewhere, um, and those people you meet at co uh, meetings, at conferences. So those are things to, to keep in mind now. How, what, you know, for this position, which of these individuals would be the best letter writers? Of course your advisor, you must have your advisor. Um, and then those you've taught for, perhaps, or been in a collaboration, say, at a government lab, uh, doing some research. Um, those would be important folks to consider. And so um, I use the verb cultivate because uh, you're building a relationship with them which, which allows them to say what they, uh, to tell them, to tell the, um, the search committee all the great things about you. The more they get to know you, the better they can do that. Okay? And, uh, very important, don't be afraid to kind of let people look at these materials. Don't do it on your own. Rely on your mentors, your advisor, your committee members, fellow students um, in reviewing your materials. Okay? This is kind of intimidating to give someone that letter. Would you please read it? You're afraid they're going to correct the grammar. It's kind of like having your paper reviewed. Um, but lay it out there. Let them see it. Get the feedback because I, I believe that's how you make a better paper. It's how you make a better cover letter. Okay. And also take take advantage of your committee members, not just for the growth of your research program and, and uh, its um, uh, relevance and impact, but um, they have so many good ideas that could help with the trajectory of your research. And I don't think, as students, I know I didn't use my committee members as much as I should have. All right, so during the interview, I've thrown in this slide because a lot of times, and we saw in the, uh, the back of the room that uh, several um, uh, experiences of late are using phone interviews as kind of the first cut. They may have 10 conversations with 10 different people, which are their top individuals. And I think this is a really good trend. Because I think it, it really um, broadens the applicant pool and allows more people access to, to um, uh, being interviewed. Okay? But it's a tough thing. The phone interview is a tough thing. Um, being on the end of being asked uh, as an interviewee uh, is very um, uh, disconcerting when there's a silence on the phone. Right? You want to fill it. Um, 
don't do that. Let, <laughs> let the committee chair lead the discussion and you know, uh, create or, uh, follow through with the questions and they usually move throughout the room. Many times that's where they have a script because it is such a strange environment. Um, uh, and if you, if you do have the opportunity for a phone interview, do it where you're, you know, your kids aren't tugging on your pants or you're, you're, <laughs> you're not in the middle of the lab um, or you're not texting or checking out your email. Get away from your computer. Don't do it with your computer on because you'll start reading the message. Okay, so now you get the phone interview. You're the, the winning candidate, one of the three or four they bring on campus. Uh, so now you're doing the interview okay, face to face. Um, and this goes back to what Tanya said is know the institution, know the department, do your homework. Um, review your itinerary carefully. You'll be given a, a, an agenda of who you're, who's picking you up at the airport. Find their face on the web. Know something about them, know their research so you can talk about it on your drive to the hotel. Uh, many times you may know them if it's, you know, from some, they usually try and pick someone who you know or is a disciplinary person so you'd have some connection. Um, and then uh, you'll have a list, you'll meet with the dean, the assistant dean, perhaps um, a bunch of individuals within the department. So know who you're meeting with and know them very well. Um, what might you ask them, kind of, you know, if you're speaking at a certain level, you don't need to ask about, oh, oh, I can't, let me get to the questions in a bit, but um, probably you'll get a half an hour with HR or employee benefits, so you can get some of that taken care of, because it's important stuff to ask, but um, you want to be doing substantive things like, uh, oh, do we have a teaching and learning uh, center? What are resources I can use? Um, you know, I know about your shared greenhouse. How does that work? How do you make that happen? Those sorts of things. Um, so they know you've looked into it. They know you're interested. Um, and you, again, review their bios and roles at the institution. And really important, to show respect to everybody you meet. Um, and that's, of course, how we all operate through life. But I've been on, I've seen interviewees who disregard the secretary, or you know, don't don't speak to them in the same way they talk to the, the professor, and we just all need to treat each other the same that way. Uh, you know, Hi, I'm so and so. Uh, what's your role at the institution? Uh, sort of thing. Okay. Um, it, some of the questions could include what are the resources there for your success. You should start getting an idea if you had a laboratory you were trying to set up. What might that lab space be like? You'll probably get a sense by visiting with other scientists what their lab space is like. You could probably say, well, where would my lab space be? Just to get that conversation going. Um, uh, is there a teaching and learning center? Um, are there startup costs? Each discipline has a different level of startup needs. Physicists, at many times, it's a half a million to get them to your institution. Uh, humanities is, is much less than that. Sorry. <laughs> Don't get giddy. Um, another point I wanted to make, I jotted this down, I forgot to bring up, is say the person picked you up from the airport or um, uh, the search committee you're meeting with, one of the individuals had a, a great recent find and it was in Science Magazine or it was in your disciplinary just a huge uh, disciplinary um, uh, forward movement in, this, in their scholarship. It's, it's a great idea to bring that sort of stuff up um, without showing favoritism or uh, um, uh, offending others. You can be very uh, engaged and knowledgeable of what they're doing on the campus. Okay. Any questions on that during the interview? can be anywhere from one to three days, depending on, you know, my discipline, many times some of the people have to go to the various farms and see what the resources are, so they have to travel, so that makes it a longer trip, a longer interview. Yes, ma'am. Um, what's kind of the time frame between when you would be potentially offered an on-site interview and when they're actually going to bring you 
like, do you have two months to pull this together, or is it like, we'll see you next week? Go like, oh, crap. Wow, yeah. What is the timeline? That's very dependent on how fast the institution needs to move, and if the dean has an open slot. Uh, I'd say two months, okay. you know, would be an average, maybe one month, if you got the short straw and were early in the, mm -hmm. it could go from one to three months, depending on getting everyone in there. Okay. Sometimes they compress it very within a week. Um, so it really depends on the institution. But hopefully, you know, you'll have done a few things to prepare your packet. You get your research seminar from your conferences. Uh, you've taught a few uh, sections and courses, because they may want you to uh, do a lecture or something. Uh, so you, you should be thinking about those materials though, well before you get the offer. That's a good point, the seminar. Um, and this is where you make or break your interview. You've made it to the interview. This better be good. Um, because it shows that you've listened to what they've asked you to do. You're with, you give your seminar within the time frame they give you. Don't ever go over. Um, <laughs> and if it's a teaching seminar, they may have asked you to speak to a certain, you know, electrical engineering, just a certain topic. Uh, fundamentals of electrical engineering, part A. Um, and so you'll have to tailor something to that, but you need to be on target with what they've asked you to do. Um, some disciplines uh, ask that you actually step into a course. The professor will have you come in and cover the talk, topic in, in Econ 101. Um, so a 50 minute lecture. Others will give you 15 minutes on the topic you choose, evolution. Um, there's this wide range there, but know what they want. And then your research topic is, is yours, other than the time constraints, to best present um, how you think your scholarship, why it's innovative, why you're going to be the best thing for them, and your discipline, or you know, what you bring as a disciplinary, the discipline you focused on, what that brings to that institution. That does remind me, I wanted to bring this up earlier, uh, sometimes decisions of the search committee, you could be the top candidate, but they already have two people that do um, plant physiology. They really needed an animal physiologist. So you may not get the job even though they brought you in and you were great. It could come down to that. It has nothing to do with you or your uh, not being the best fit other than they needed a different discipline. I hope that uh, makes sense. So and when you give your talk, um, tell a story. Right? That's what our research talks are all about. Why am I doing this? Why is this important to society? And here's what I found, and here's why it's innovative, and here's why it has a great future. Um, know your story. Don't present something you're a little, you know, you haven't quite figured it out yet. You get all discombobulated. Um, know your audience. Um, so, should you be speaking to your, uh, if, uh, if it's a diverse department, um, I guess most departments are diverse because we all have sub-disciplines. And at a place like Montana State, many times we're only one person deep in those sub-disciplines. So it's pretty hard to uh, uh, have a, perhaps in chemistry though, you'd have all analytical chemists. I guess that's an example I'll use. Um, if that were the audience, I would speak to just analytical chemists. But more than likely, you're going to have a physical chemist, a biochemist, um, etc. So you need to remember they don't all have the same fundamental knowledge, even though they're all chemists. Uh, speak to that audience rather than the analytical chemist guru that's there in the room. I think that's a better way to, to so you know your audience. Because that, that reflects on your ability to tell a story and how you'll interact with students too. Um, be prepared, follow the time allotted, um, and take, you know, take advantage of conferences beforehand to get experience speaking. And before you go, have your boss or your uh, grad, fellow grad students give the talk with you, or you give it to them, and they'll give you a lot of good uh, uh, constructive comments. Almost done here. So, a couple things you need to be prepared for is answering questions, and of course asking questions, that's the next slide. Uh, these are just examples that I pulled off the web, some are my own. Um, uh, why? Why do you want to work at this sort of institution? 
So that would be a question, a very fair question, if you're at a community college, uh, Indian community college, Native American community college, or at a research one uh, institution. Those, that's an important thing to know. Why are you looking at this institution? And then the why this one? Why are you looking at Montana State? It's got to be more than I like Bozeman. Okay. Um, why is your research important? And that's part of part of um, the talk you'll be giving. But also, you need to be ready to uh, give a lay answer. You know, the two-minute elevator speech. You know, why is it important? The forty-minute talk is one thing, but can you really you know, just drill down and say what why is it? Um, what are your startup needs? You should give that some thought. Do you need a lot of glassware? Do you need a quarter million instrument, a quarter million dollar instrument to do your work? My crop a microscope, um, that sort of thing. I had someone actually ask me this. Uh, this was a tough one. It was rather disarming, um, and I think it was meant to be. So be ready for those kinds of things. Just stay cool. What brings you joy in life, Tracy? Uh, <laughs> it, was, it was a really difficult question. It was from uh, someone who was uh, at the dean level. Um, and so it was a real kind of, I think he just wanted to know who I was. Um, uh, and that's a, you know, those are sorts of questions that could be asked. So like discussing your hobbies or yeah. outside interests? Right. Okay. Hopefully you'll do that and not just say, oh, you know, uh, my research project. I mean, I think they're looking for a whole person who will, who will be part of this family of faculty at that institution. Uh, you're normal. <laughs> and you love your kids and, you know. Uh, it can also open up, because uh, I had to say, my kids, of course. And, um, but then that's, now they know I have kids. And they're not supposed to ask that, right? Um, it's fine, it's fine for me but to, to share that. But not everyone's willing to do that, or should be. Um, so it was an interesting question. It was disarming for me. But be ready for that. Be thinking about that sort of thing. Just look cool. Ah, good question. Kind of delay your response by <laughs> well, that's really a thoughtful question. Um, <laughs> instead of a deer in the headlights, like I probably looked. Um, how do you work with underprepared or undermotivated students? Those are two very different things. Uh, will your Will your spouse move with you? I just threw this up here. Can they ask you that? Nope. <laughs> no, they can't. They can't ask you those sorts of questions. I've actually had people who've interviewed without their wedding rings just to keep people on, on edge. So what do you do if they ask you a question because they're not supposed to? Oh, man. They can't ask. Yeah, they're, they're supposed to not. Um, okay, but what if they do? You just, you know, friendly and gracious the whole way. Don't say, what? I don't think that's a productive use of time, even though it's your right to do that. Um, and I think particularly for women, those sorts of questions come up more than for men. Well, how are you going to handle it if your husband you know, has a job and has to do his job? Um, so, you know, we'll work it out, or uh, yes, I do have kids, or I, I don't know. I, I I've, seen, I've seen it happen. Yeah, it, it, you know, I've been in, in those places where it's happened, and what, what is best to happen in that case is another search committee member says, come on, George, you can't ask that. I've seen that happen. Yeah, and then that diffuses it. But sometimes, that, sometimes somebody else won't step in. Uh, right, and, and that's and really the responsibility. Yeah, yeah. The, but the search committee should take their responsibility seriously, and, and that's part of it, is kind of policing that. Because um, it can affect how people view your packet. If they're bringing in these erroneous, or not erroneous, but uh, extracurricular uh, activities um, that are un uh, irrelevant to your being able to do the job. And, uh, you know, after 30 years of this, I still can't say how, you know, I'm a lot more comfortable just saying, well, this is who I am than I was 30 years ago, of course. Uh, but. I'm sorry, I don't have a. It's a, it's a <laughs> not to sense this situation. Yeah, you just don't want to come off as. Even though they're the one being rude, you'll be on the spot. Sometimes you, I think you can do better just to have, just to answer the question. I mean, you know that it's right. it's it's out of bounds, but I, right. And I so does the can, whole room. You can, you can actually do more harm by avoiding it. 
question. Or, mm -hmm. just answer it. or getting up. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I do apologize. It's your right not to answer that question. But I, I really struggle with that myself. So I'm, I'm sorry I don't have a clear answer for that, for the crowd on that one. All right, and we're almost done here. Um, how do you reach students with diverse learning styles in the same class? Uh, how have you incorporated technology into your teaching? What experiences do you have working with non-traditional students? Just things that they might ask you that perhaps you haven't thought about, um, and you should before this, um, just to have some sort of answer. There's many, many more questions online uh, at these sites I'll give you um, in the back. Now, here are some of the prepared questions to think about. Um, in, you know, how are department decisions made? You know, is it faculty governance? Is it department head just dictating everything? And uh, you'll get a sense of a culture and how people get along when you're at an institution. Um, and you need to take that to heart. If everyone seems charged and just kind of angry with each other all the time, is that where you want to work? Is it, is it a much more collegial environment? Um, those are important considerations because this is a big commitment. Um, and, you're, and I guess the, final, the other thing I want to say is you are interviewing them as well, which I didn't make a slide for, but I should have. Um, may I have a copy of your annual report? You know, can I see what you all do? And usually it's pretty clear on the web and more what departments are doing and what, what accomplishments they've had. What is the nature of the tenure review process or the criteria they use for you to reach tenure? or earn tenure. Do um, you guys know anything about promotion and tenure? Have you talked about that with your advisors? That's an important thing, too. A lot of institutions are moving toward a more transparent, um, flexible approach where uh, you know the criteria. It's not just a hidden hurdle that you know, changes all the time. Uh, be, you know, uh, investigate how they've written their document. Um, a lot of institutions have flexibility. In general, it's after five years you go up for tenure. At most institutions, maybe seven. But most institutions now have also a, a extending the tenure clock or probation. It's really a probationary period. It's pre-tenure. And extending that a year if you were to bring a, a child into the family or you had a huge medical emergency or you were taken up, you know, you're, you're in the, the guard and you had to go to Iraq. So you could have an extension of your uh, tenure clock that way. So know those. And then, you know, ask those questions. Is there a formal mentoring program? Um, that's, formal mentoring is um, uh, one way that institutions are, are using to better, uh, to be more inclusive of new individuals, particularly underrepresented individuals, because they don't so easily get into the informal networks playing racquetball or going out for beer. Um, so a formal mentoring program is to find out if they have that, how does it work. You can ask about the benefits. What's your student body like? Uh, how, do you, how are your um, classrooms resourced with um, uh, teaching technology? What kind of shared research facilities do you have? Do you have a bioinformatics center if that's of interest to you? Do you have a greenhouse facility? Um, how well does the library meet our needs? Um, and then what are the courses you want filled? What, you know, also have an idea of what kind of courses you would like to teach relative. So have that. I didn't put that as a question, but um, that would be something they'd ask you. What kind of class would you like to teach? Really? Let's see. So finally, uh, be yourself. Don't be someone you're not, because that's always dangerous. Be knowledgeable telling them who you are, but be care, you know, be mindful of not careful, be mindful of always remember your audience, you know, are you at the graduate student luncheon uh, where the grad students are all meeting you, uh, how should you, uh, what kind of questions should you have for them versus for the dean when you're meeting with the dean, um, know when to talk and know when to listen, you don't have to fill every silence, okay, and listen, listen to the questions, watch the individual's body language. Your body language is important. Always face people, have facial expressions. Uh, lean in when they're talking so you look uh, attentive. Um, uh, look pleasant. You don't have to smile all the time, but um, don't look unhappy. 
perhaps you will be if it's not the right fit. Um, you won't be enjoying the experience, which can happen. Uh, and everyone figures that out pretty quickly. Um, let's see. Uh, and like, say, say you do do the graduate student lunch, student lunch with, or maybe undergrads, or some group. Proximity is what, what I mean by that is how do you enter the room and where do you sit down? You know, make sure don't just go to the corner like most of us introverts want to, and wait for everyone to come to you. You, <laughs> you really need to, you know. Um, give of yourself, and it might be hard, or you could even practice at lab meetings or something. But introduce yourself if, if, if you haven't seen them yet. Just show a friendly uh, posturing to folks. Um, and that breaks down barriers and, and helps them ask questions and get the dialogue so they get to know you better. That's the main reason. Eye contact. Um, polite behavior. Does anyone know where the salad fork goes? <laughs> Okay, good, fork. good. And then the dessert fork's up top, right? <laughs> um, I'm just teasing because I never knew any of that. Um, and I just would watch who picked up the salad fork for her first. When you, when you don't know, you, you watch, take their lead. Um, I know that sounds goofy, but uh, you, you don't want to be impolite. And that can be, um, table manners can be viewed as if you're not doing them properly. But, um, Lots of thank yous, you know, for the time they've spent. And then always remember what, what they're looking for is, is a colleague. And so uh, you are as well. So that's, that's the, the give and take of the interview process. You're looking at them as well. And then um, I guess the, the final point I want, I forgot to put it up there, is what do you do after the interview? And I think it's always nice to, to send a thank you note, I, even an email saying, I really enjoyed this guy, I really enjoyed getting to know you all, appreciate learning your trajectory and how it might fit in, and looking forward to hearing from you. That sort of thing is, it's not a mandatory thing. You're not going to lose, you're not going to get or gain or lose the job because of that, but um, it just kind of closes up the whole process. And then these are the, the sites uh, that you could go to, and you just Google them from Chronicle of Higher Ed. Um, this and tomorrow's professor science careers and then gradschool.com uh, had the how to interview for a faculty position and so there's all kinds of resources I just tried to pull out some of the salient ones I've learned through learned from being interviewee as well as an interview